G'day guys and welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for another draft preview video. This time we're going to be having a look at some hypothetical trade scenarios that could play out on the actual day of the 2023 draft, which if you didn't know is on November 20th, that will be the first round and the second round and the rest of the draft will be on November 21st. So uh, we have now hit that point where clubs can no longer trade picks in advance of the draft. There is a blackout period. And now until West Coast starts the clock on their five minute selection of Harley Reid, you'd think, uh, that is the next time we can see a trade for picks. But since live trading has become a thing, we've seen it fairly regularly in various drafts. So we can expect the same thing will happen again. And the point of this video, I guess, is to try and sort of predict whereabouts live trades might take place and which clubs we think will be likely candidates. Some of this is based on some pretty good reporting and some of this is also based on just some ideas I have for potential trades that we could see take place in the upcoming draft. I'm very excited now. We're less than a week until D-Day. Part of me can't wait until it's all over. But again, like I've said in previous videos, it's just about my favorite day of the year. So can't wait for it all to kick off. Before we get into the video, guys, if you could do me a favor and consider subscribing to the channel. Uh, I had a look into my analytics and over the last 28 days, we've had 29,000 returning viewers to the True Footy YouTube channel. So that's people who've watched the video and then come back again. So can't help but notice, but that is way more more than the subscribers that I have, and I'm trying to hit 24,000 subscribers by the day of the draft. So if you do me a favor and subscribe to the channel, if you are enjoying the content, I would very much appreciate it. So let's kick it off with a few trade hypotheticals or predictions or analysis of where we think trades could happen. We're gonna start off with pick one. Now, before you lose interest, I know I've covered this a lot on this channel and it has been a fairly saturated news story. So I won't go into this in too much depth, but I'll give you a little bit of a background exactly where this sits. And what I mean is West Coast holding pick one and effectively Harley Reid and the clubs that could try and prize it from them. At this stage, it appears it's pretty much only going to be North Melbourne who have the necessary collateral to try and make Make a deal work and we know at the last update that the best offer that they've offered is 2 15 and 17 for 1 and 23 which was subsequently rejected so there is a small chance that north melbourne best this offer somehow whether they take 23 out of the equation i really don't think they would offer two and three at this stage but that is the last glimmer of possibility where harley reed ends up at north melbourne is north melbourne improving their offer and west coast accepting it live we know that melbourne and hawthorne uh, both had interest in trading up for pick one. Melbourne offered 6, 11, 42 and a future first. And uh, Hawthorne, it was reported, offered two first round picks. Now, that is the best offer that those clubs can potentially muster. So they're more or less out of the running if they've been rejected in first instance. Then it seems highly unlikely West Coast would accept it as a live trade. So I'll just put that one to bed. I don't think this deal will happen, but North Melbourne trading live for Harley Reid is still a slight possibility. Okay, so let's get into some of the more realistic trade suggestions. So... First of all, we do know it has been reported that Geelong have shown a bit of an interest in trying to split what is currently pick eight in the draft. Obviously, they've got a five list spots I think they've got to take, and they have eight, 25, and then picks at the back end of the draft. So them getting more picks in this draft makes sense, and trading eight down is one possibility. Now, one club that is rumored to be interested in that particular pick is the Adelaide Crows. They presumably have a particular target in this year's top 10. It's currently pick eight, but it will become pick 10 after Academy bids. So a few suggestions of who that might be. Well, I have highlighted before, I think they need a key defender. So perhaps they know that their current pick won't be good enough to get someone like a Connor O'Sullivan. Uh, it's unlikely they'd trade up for another key forward in Nate Caddy. So an O'Sullivan type makes sense. It's also not completely out of the realms of possibility that Daniel Curtin is still available there as he seems to be sliding down the ranks a little bit. But regardless, Adelaide do have some sort of target in the top 10, you'd think. So one potential way Adelaide could get there is packaging 10 and 20 for Geelong's pick eight. And maybe they get something back in the future draft, maybe a future second or a future third, something back Adelaide's way. If Geelong turn eight into 10 and 20, they get two bites of the apple in what is potentially a pretty even draft pool. And on the other hand, Crows potentially get their target in the top 10. And they also accumulate some extra points for their father-son pick in next year's draft. So I think there's some potential here. How realistic it is, obviously I'm speculating. From the Cats' point of view in this particular draft, they'd probably be hoping for Nate Caddy. If they trade back a couple of spots, they might lose him to the Essendon Football Club. And presumably, they probably also won't get a shot at Connor O'Sullivan too. So they would lose out on a key position player if they did this trade. Potentially Darcy Wilson would be an adequate first round draft pick for them. I'm not too sure. I guess we'll wait and see. 
One other club that is reportedly, according to Callum Toomey, a Toomey rumor, a Toomer, oh no, that's not nice, is Sydney. Sydney are reportedly trying to trade into the top 10 of this year's draft. So what they currently hold is uh, their nominal pick of pick 12 and next year's priority pick from North Melbourne, which I think is around 20. I think it's the second of the two priority picks. If not, it's pick 19. So Sydney offering 12 and let's call it pick 20 next year to try and move into the top 10. Toomey also has reported that the clubs so far have been unwilling to do this deal. Now, Geelong would be one candidate, but my logic, and I think is fairly reasonable logic, is that Geelong would want picks in this year's draft to make it work. Splitting their pick and moving down the order for picks in next year's draft doesn't help their situation now of needing to fill list spots. So Sydney might be struggling probably to get uh, the right candidate for this particular deal, but nonetheless, it's evident that they've got their own target inside the top 10. Again, another side with a key back, and maybe they pick Connor O'Sullivan if they do manage to get a trade done. So those are the ones that have been reported as uh, clubs actively trying to make trades happen. We'll move into uh, some a little bit more hypothetical stuff here. There has been a loose suggestion, more so on big footy circles than you know Toomey or uh, official reporting or anything like that. But there has been some suggestion that Melbourne would be interested in trading up for Zane Dersma from Gippsland Power. Now, North Melbourne are likely going to take him at three or four. To make this deal work, Melbourne probably need to acquire pick three from the North Melbourne Footy Club. The reason being, if they trade for pick four, and sorry, when I say pick four, I mean it'll be pick four after the Jed Walter bid. But if they live trade for what will become pick four, they run the risk of North Melbourne picking Dersmo pick three anyway. So it really needs to be pick three. So Melbourne could offer six and 11 to try and get three from North Melbourne. Is that too generous an offer? I think so, probably. Maybe they ask for 18 back from North Melbourne. So six and 11 for three and 18. I can see why North Melbourne would be disinterested in that, but on balance, it's probably about right. But it would be interesting to see if Melbourne try and move up to get Zane Dersma. So moving on with a few other rumors. Um, one thing I've done is I've kind of gone through Callum Toomey's latest phantom form guide because what he's added is a little side note or footnote under each player about where they could go. And some interesting tidbits came up from that because there are clubs interested in certain players that didn't make a lot of sense given their range of that pick. So one example of that is the fact that in the latest Phantom Form Guide, Toomey actually highlights that Hawthorne have put a lot of work into Nate Caddy, which is interesting because they currently hold what will become pick five in the draft. And that seems a little bit early for Nate Caddy. They've been largely linked to Nick Watson, assuming Zane Dersma is not available. And you'd have to say, based on what we know, Nate Caddy is not a realistic top five shout at this current point in time. And what I mean by that is, if he was a realistic chance to be taken inside the top five, I really think we would have heard it by now. So, you know, just, just humoring this, this theory for a moment, is there a possibility that Hawthorne really wants Zane Dersma? And potentially now, they're resigned to the possibility, or the very likely possibility, that he's not gonna be there. Are they then willing to trade down from pick five to somewhere in the bottom part of the top 10 and acquire Nate Caddy? Maybe. I think the most likely outcome here is that they do take this pick. They'll probably take Nick Watson or potentially Dan Curtin, more likely Nick Watson in my personal opinion. But if a club could offer them something juicy in exchange for that slight downgrade and they get Nate Caddy, a player that they're clearly interested in, this could work out. So again, not likely, none of these I'd say are likely to happen, but they are distinct possibilities. Using that same sort of technique to try and figure out where trades might happen, I also had a look in the form guide and found that Essendon has also put a lot of time into Riley Hardiman out of Western Australia. Now, Essendon currently hold pick 11 at the start of the draft, which should become pick 13. Hardiman's range is more considered 15 to about 25 um, and probably more like 17 to 25 if we're being really specific. So Essendon going for him at pick 13, it's a little bit of a reach, not the most enormous reach we would have seen in drafts certainly in my time following drafts, but are Essendon potentially bracing for the possibility that they could trade 13 back a few spaces in exchange for something else and have subsequently put a lot of time into someone like Riley Hardiman, who could be there at 17, 18, potentially even 23. So again, nothing concrete here, I'm speculating, but that one definitely caught my eye. On the topic of West Coast, once again, uh, there has been some suggestion, nothing concrete, but there has been a vague suggestion that West Coast would be interested in trading back into the first round of this uh, draft to take Dan Curtin, someone they've been linked with all year. It's unclear whether West Coast are genuinely interested in Dan Curtin or if that's kind of been some lazy connection made by Victorian media or frankly, even West Australian media, it doesn't know. So it's unclear, but if West Coast are big fans of Dan Curtin, surely there is a temptation to trade a future pick 
into the top 10 likely of this year's draft to secure him in the, yeah, probably pick eight or nine. Following the trends, it does seem like Dan Curtin is sliding a little bit. So I previously thought pick four to North Melbourne made sense. That seems to be dipping a little bit. Hawthorne's a chance to pick five for sure, but I think they'll go Nick Watson. Western Bulldog surely wouldn't take another key back after Buzzlinger a couple of years ago. That means that he's a distinct possibility to end up at Melbourne's pick, which will become pick eight on the night. So could West Coast be tempted to offer a future first round pick for Daniel Curtin? I think it's possible. The other question is whether they should do it. And I probably would argue no, considering West Coast are likely to be wooden spooners, or at least going to start as favorites for the wooden spoon for 2024. And this would be a steep price to pay. I don't see any other possible deal getting it done. Maybe they could sway Melbourne to swap first rounders next year and then an extra sweetener for them as well. I'm not too sure, but it was one that's going to have a bit of intrigue about it anyway, especially as an Eagles fan. Continuing on the West Coast topic for just one moment, it has also been reported by John Ralph that West Coast are actively trying to trade into the top 25 of this year's draft. Now, looking at the top 25 picks, the only team I could really make a case for being open to such a trade request would be potentially the Crows. Like I said, we made the same argument before about how they knew, need to acquire some points for next year's draft. Could they be tempted for a swap of a future second round pick for the West Coast, which would probably be like pick 21 for 25 in this year's draft or whatever Adelaide's pick ends up being? Maybe West Coast offer a sweetener on top of that. Most likely they would. I'm not too sure. The, the candidates for that particular trade seem limited, but we do know it has been officially reported West Coast are trying to acquire another top 25 pick. Again, this one is not so much a rumor, but I would suggest that we all keep a little eye on Fremantle in this particular draft. We know that they haven't really traded into this draft at all. They had no first rounder due to the Luke Jackson deal. And despite losing two players this offseason, have now three first rounders next year, but don't hold a first rounder this year. So obviously there's been a lot of conjecture, particularly on this channel, about what they're going to do with those future first round picks. Are they loading up for an offer for Logan McDonald? Or are they being creative, holding some future assets, potentially waiting to see where someone, first of all, like a Dan Curtin may fall? If Dan Curtin slides to, say, a pick eight, could they throw a future first round pick or a combination of picks at Melbourne's way to tempt them? I'm not saying Melbourne would be tempted in the slightest, but that is one option Fremantle could be looking at with their future picks. Another one is Lance Collard, another player that they have put a lot of time into. And if that's the case, at pick 34 or whatever it will become, maybe 37 on the actual night, that seems a little bit late for Lance Collard when you consider as well West Coast have a pick before that. So by that logic, they're putting a lot of time into Lance Collard. They're on the market for forward half players, in particular small forwards. I would be keeping an eye on Fremantle trading into this year's draft potentially ahead of West Coast to try and nab Lance Collard. And finally, I will just list the fact that Gold Coast may or may not need to trade live for points to accumulate more points for um, their academy players. I didn't want to delve into the specifics of this because I don't know how many of you really care and I couldn't really be bothered. Again, it all kind of depends on where the bids fall for these particular academy players because Jed Walter we know is going to be picked two. Ethan Reed's probably going to be six or seven, you'd think. And Jake Rogers could be anywhere in the teens. It's, it's kind of unclear that one. So working out all the permutations that I didn't think was valuable for this particular video. But as a little footnote, I will say this will present some opportunities for clubs to accumulate potentially future picks in doing live trades with Gold Coast who need to accumulate points. And we know Gold Coast can be generous with their trading. But anyway, guys, that is my take on some potential live trades we will see in this year's draft. There will be some. There will be some. And it is obviously really, really hard to predict. We didn't see too many, if any. Uh, maybe there was one, if, if any, trades done after trade period until November 10. So potentially clubs are just waiting to see what is available at their respective picks before making their moves. But should be very, very intriguing. This sort of stuff makes phantom drafts an absolute nightmare. But I'm still excited and can't wait to join in all the fun with you as it goes ahead. As always, guys, I appreciate you watching the channel. Subscribe to it if you haven't already. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.